Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, Hurricane Helene sets a record as the deadliest U.S. storm since Katrina. New drone video shows just how bad the situation is in Asheville. The city's now isolated after roads leading there flooded and cell towers were knocked down. One emergency official calls it biblical devastation. We look at the impact in North Carolina and the new lifelines people are relying on as the extent becomes fully known. I'm Malika Biral, and this is The Take. It only takes seconds for everything to be washed away. Imagine witnessing the moment a mudslide swallows everything in its path. My guest today has been reporting on the devastation in the state he calls home. My name is Brent Jensen. I'm the senior reporter at WBT Radio here in Charlotte, and we are the largest news radio station either in North or South Carolina. Wow. Well, Brett, it is really good to have you here. Welcome to The Take. You are based in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is inland and about two hours east of some of the cities and the towns that were hardest hit by Helene. You visited some of those towns this week, places where it's hard to tell what the exact death toll is because so many places are still so hard to reach. On X, you wrote a post that says, as someone who describes things for a living, this was practically indescribable. So try as you can, how would you describe this? You know, the word that's being, you know, tossed around a lot is, you know, apocalyptic. We throw that word out there a lot, but at the same point, I don't know how else you describe it because, you know, everything, there are villages that are no longer exist, that no longer stand. And when I say villages or small towns, anywhere from a village that maybe house, you know, 500 people of residents to places that have 5,000 that just no longer stand and exist anymore due to either the flooding and the rivers and the creeks changing courses and deciding to go down Main Street because there's nowhere else for that river to go or these gigantic mudslides because you have to remember, we're in the mountains over there and so all the water funnels down to the valleys and it's the valleys where all the towns are. And so you've got all the water coming down on either side of you and next thing you know, if you get three feet of rain over three days, which is what happened, It just, it has to go somewhere and you get all these mudslides. And so it's not just the flooding. It was all the mudslides that wiped people out in their houses and the communities out as well. Wow. So talk to me about how easy or hard it was to get to some of these areas, including a place called Chimney Rock. On Sunday, I went up there and I couldn't get there. And because bridges were, you know, completely washed away near dams and people were concerned that these dams were going to bust and because a lot of them are so very old and they weren't going to withstand all the pressure from the water. So I went back on Monday and I was able to finagle my way around to get past police barricades. And you have to basically either have to have lived there Mm. or you better have special permission to get there because so many roads are blocked or impassable. Um, and so I was able to get there, but up to the Lake Lord Chimney Rock area. And uh, Chimney Rock is a state park here in North Carolina. And Lake Lore is a uh, upper scale resort area. As a matter of fact, it's where Dirty Dancing was filmed. Mm-hmm. The movie with Patrick Swayze in the mm-hmm. 80s. To give you perspective, that's what it looks like. Beautiful, so, idyllic, green. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. And the town of Chimney Rock, the little village that they call it, no longer exists. It's in Lake Lore. It's in the lake. And that's some of the video that I had posted that all the debris you see comes from the village on the other side of the lake. And so it is uh, in these towns, the only way to get there a lot of times is by helicopter because there's only one road into these remote towns in the mountains and the road is impassable because the bridge is washed away or the roads are washed away. And the only way to get them is through air because you can't get there by land. Wow. I'm trying to wrap my brain around what it means that Chimney Rock just no longer exists, or it exists, but it's in the lake. What does that mean for the people who lived there, who worked there, um, when you were trying to 
finagle your way into the town. You must have talked to people who either gave you permission or didn't. What did they tell you about what they've seen? It's funny. I was leaving Chimney Rock and the Lake Lore area, getting ready to head back to Charlotte. And it's about a two-hour drive. And on the side of the road near a cafe was a man putting out all this food. And uh, so I went, I just pulled in and asked him why he was setting all this food out. And he said, well, I own the cafe and we're setting all this food out because it's just going to go bad. So we're just trying to give it away for people who are live here who may not have access to food. And it was jars of olives and, you know, and chicken and cheesecakes, blueberry cheesecakes and strawberry <laughs> cheesecakes. And so I started interviewing him and he said, the biggest problem is because this town and community relies almost 100% on tourism. And he said, it's going to be months if not a year before that tourism starts coming back because it's going to take that long to rebuild things. And, you know, sadly enough, I didn't know this. He had just bought that restaurant and cafe one week earlier. Oh, wow. Wow. So, Brett, I know that communication is often a lifesaver in disasters like this if you can get communication. But we know that cell towers, power lines were destroyed in the storm. Um, We lost power Thursday night, Uh, between Thursday night and Friday morning. We haven't had power, water, very low on food. How are people communicating? How are they letting people know where they are? How are they getting what they need now that the storm has passed? What does that look like? So... At the Lake Lure area, I had zero bars. As a matter of fact, the cell phone wouldn't even allow SOS. <laughs> and, you know, and so, I mean, it was it was non-functional. And then you get a few miles away and then you might get one bar. Um, so they are, but this the mountains, the deeper mountains where they're having the bigger issues. And speaking to one of the civilian helicopter people that were driving around trying to rescue people um, over the last three, four days, he was saying that people are carving SOS in like their yards in the mud because in North Carolina, it's red clay. It's not brown soil. It's red clay hmm. that we have. And people are carving in giant letters SOS in the red clay or trying to put things on top of their roof that spell SOS wow. so people can see you as they're flying over. And that's their you know, main way of communication. Um, or they might hike out and know that they have to hike several miles just to try and get cell service or to the next town where they can alert people going, hey, we've got a whole host of people back here um, in this little town with no access out. Um, can you send someone to help us or can you do food drops? And so so now they're actually doing airlifts and food drops because they can't get to the people. Hmm. I know that local radio, which warms my heart, local radio has been a lifeline for some of those without communication. With Hurricane Helene, we have to be clear here. Heavy rains and winds are coming. Beware and prepare. And so they're calling into stations um, to try to find their loved ones, to talk about what they need Um to ask for evacuation, uh, help, and routes. You are working at a station that, as you mentioned, is the largest news station in North or South Carolina. You're based, though, about two hours east of these hard-hit communities. How are you seeing this lifeline of radio and broadcast um, for people who are in those hardest-hit regions? Well, I appreciate you asking that question because right now... There's um, a trend going on where a lot of cars are not including AM radio. We are AM and FM, but we are most powerful as an AM radio. But um, what they're doing is they've now, the state government and FEMA and local governments have started asking for radios, actual transistor radios, old school radios, so they can hear the news and figure out what's going on with the broadcast so we can tell them, hey, Uh, make sure if you can get to this shelter, go to this shelter, or if you need help or survival, try and do this so we can see you from your air, you know, while we're flying over. And so now they're actually asking, the government's asking for radios so they can hear us broadcast or hear the emergency broadcasting and instructions on what to do over the airways. And so radio right now is one of the only ways to communicate with these people 
uh, that are stuck in the mountains. And, and again, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, people say, well, how come it's taking so long to fix the, the cell phone towers? You can't fix what you can't get to. Hmm. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit more about getting to these places and what that's looked like. Let's talk about the federal government's response. On Wednesday, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris began a visit to South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. I've been in frequent contact with the governors and other leaders in the impacted areas. And uh, we have to jumpstart this recovery process. People are scared to death. On the ground, we've been hearing survivors complain about the lack of preparation, the lack of warning by state and federal authorities, and this late response that days after people still are in need of water and so many other life-saving measures. A lot of us um, had water on hand that we're sharing if needed. And then for flush and toilets, we're going down the street to the spring and collecting rainwater if it comes and just kind of figuring out our system. What is your take on that response, what people have told you about how fast or slow it is, and do you see a difference between the local response and the federal government's response? So that question, let's let's take the first part first. And there was ample warning. Governor Cooper was doing press conferences. Uh, he, he, the governor of North Carolina, Governor Roy Cooper, they were doing press conferences with the emergency secretaries and all the health, Department of Health and Human Services and the National Guard. Maybe these people aren't watching the local news. Maybe they're not looking on the Internet and trying to see what's happening. They're like, well, you know, we're in the mountains. What, what can a hurricane do to us? Now, in terms of the response, the fact that FEMA showed up on Monday and, you know, and this happened on Friday, a lot of people are extremely upset at that. From um, a local government standpoint, state government extremely upset at the very poor response. Uh, I've spoken to many people, boots on the ground there at the front lines of all this, uh, these services and the rescue efforts saying that no one seems to be in charge. No mm -hmm. one knows what's really going on. And that is complete and utter chaos. And that if it weren't for the civilians taking things upon themselves, you know, trying to use mules to mm -hmm. get to these people wow. or doing their own airplane drops, their private little airplane, single engine propeller airplane drops of supplies or helicopter rescues. If it wasn't for them doing that, it would be much, much more catastrophic in terms of death tolls. Wow. And these are people trying to do it on their own because the government's not doing it. As a matter of fact, you hear things of for every 20 helicopters that are civilian, that there might only be two uh, National Guard helicopters or federal helicopters. After the break... We hear from a local volunteer about how her community is coming together to help. In the wake of the storm, local volunteers have been taking aid into their own hands. One of the hotspots is Asheville. It's a city in western North Carolina that's home to about 95,000 people and a hub for arts and culture. We heard from a volunteer with beloved Asheville, a group that's come together to collect donations and deliver aid. Megan Carroll also works for the Asheville Home Builders Association. I'm out at the Love today. We are helping to coordinate getting more resources out to the community. They've been out here since day one, tirelessly trying to get stuff for folks um, that are not able to come by. Um, there's a really large organized effort to get this out to different um, communities throughout Western North Carolina. So there's a volunteer that's been working on that for hours and hours. I can't even begin to tell you, like, it looked so different than this, and there's just so much. So it's, it's so impressive the way they've been working together, um, and our community has come together in this time. Well, Brett, as we've seen so often in many places around the world, in the absence of the state or the federal or that official help, it's people to people, person to person helping each other out. You talk to people in these remote areas like Lake Lure and Hendersonville, survivors and others who came to the area to help, to do what they could. How did you see people helping each other? Well, you know, right now they're trying to say, you know, should we donate supplies, water, toilet paper, diapers? Um, Samaritan's Purse, the, you know, they are a big uh Charitable, charitable organization, maybe the second biggest behind the American Red Cross, and they're based here in North Carolina. And they're in Boone, one of the areas impacted by this. And they put out a release yesterday saying, 
we've got so much donations, we're overflowing. Mm. We can't accept any more donations because we've got we've got it all between the water and the food and the diapers and whatever, the baby formula. They said, please stop sending us mm. stuff we can't handle anymore. Wow. And so that's a that's a good problem to have. But at the same point, you know, uh, I was speaking to a congressman, uh, someone who's about to be elected in his first term as Congress uh, in this upcoming November. He was former military, West Point, was in Afghanistan, flew on Chinook helicopters in Afghanistan. And he's been part of these civilian helicopter rescue efforts. And, you know, he said, Brett, you know, we get there and we're trying to save these retirement homes, you know, these older people, 60, 70, 80 years old. Yeah. And we're, you know, and we're bringing like 30 out and 25 out. He said, but then you come to the realization that if you move some of these people, then they're probably not gonna make the trip out and they might pass while in the helicopter. If helicopters had not been used, would these people have been savable? No, no, definitely not. And there's a there's a lot of communities across Western North Carolina right now that are just totally cut off. And I'll tell you, the saddest part, we actually had to leave four folks behind uh, that, that, you know, we were concerned that, you know, they if they got on the helicopter, they'd pass on the helicopter. They're having to make the tough decisions to leave them behind mm-hmm. so they can, as he put it, die in peace and be with what loved ones they have in, sur- in su- familiar surroundings. So they have to leave some people behind while rescuing others. So when it comes to these difficult decisions, I think from the outside, one of the ones people often wonder are, we hear talk of rebuilding. Are people going to rebuild or are they going to move? And we know the weather is getting more extreme places far from water um, and elevated areas that were once considered these climate havens, like Asheville was considered a climate haven, are now not as safe from extreme weather. Do you think, based on the people you talk to, that survivors will rebuild and just learn to acclimate? Or are people talking about needing to find a new place to call home? Well, you know, these people that live in the mountains, you know, most of them are from there and they've lived there their entire lives. And so that's their home and they generally don't leave. There was a building right there in between those two, gone. You know, that's that's an area where they were born, they were raised, and they want to die there. They're very, very keen on the sense of community and their surroundings and the people that they grew up with and family and friends. And so, yes, while you may have some leave, um, the small towns, especially those that can't be rebuilt, a lot of them don't have the wealth or wherewithal to be able to move, pick up and move somewhere else. Looking back at all that you saw this past week, um, I wonder just in your estimation and then in what officials are saying, how long do you think it's actually going to take to rebuild? Because you were vacationing just a month ago, right? In in some of these areas. They didn't look like this. How long is it going to take for them to get back to that? Some will never get back. Um, You will have others that maybe rebound much faster. Asheville, Hendersonville, the bigger communities should rebound much faster. Uh, Maybe Lake Lore, just because it's so popular. Uh, But here's the thing. You've got, I think, so Duke Energy is the largest uh, power company, utility company in the country. And they service North Carolina, South Carolina, and, you know, a lot of other states in the Southeast. And they came out the other day and said that over 304, about 340 power substations have to be repaired or completely rebuilt. Whoa. And of that they need over a thousand transformers. And transformers take forever to get. They they come in, most of them come in from out of the country and are shipped here. And it can take, it can take a couple months just to try and get one transformer. And so now you're talking about, you're gonna not be able to have power for many of these very remote places for a very long time. That's why the gas stations are overwhelmed because people are trying to buy gas for their generators to keep their electricity up and running and their households up and running. So, I mean, it it could honestly take over a year. Mm -hmm. It could maybe take 18 months, two years before some of these 
communities are fully whole again, just because it's going to take so long to A, rebuild the roads, Mm -hmm. rebuild the bridges, and then try and fix all the power stations that supply electricity to these places, as well as the water and the sewage treatment plants um, that have been overrun and aren't working anymore. Hmm. Well, Brett, thank you for taking the time to share this with us and for your reporting. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And that's The Take. At Al Jazeera Podcasts, we want to hear from listeners and viewers like you. So if you have a few minutes, go to aljazeera.com slash survey and tell us about yourself. From things like how you listen to us to what kind of shows you want to listen to or topics you'd like us to cover. Again, that's aljazeera.com slash survey. <laughs> 